I'm delighted to say we have cabin fullback Park Faulkner and tip forward Michael Quinn living with us to help us preview the All Ireland final. Uh, gents, you're both very welcome this morning. Park, I might start with you. Uh, we're very interested in the dynamics of the Dublin forward line and just how they go about creating space. As somebody who's come up close and personal with them, what was that actually like? How, how did you manage that? And were there aspects of that which, um, which surprised you on the pitch, even having done all the video analysis, that actually there, were, there was something about these forwards that maybe um, you can't see in the analysis? Yeah, um, it, was, it was a team like we have never played before. I suppose uh, uh, Dublin coming into the game, uh, we, we, we did our lots and lots of homework on them and we, we did know the way they moved, the way they make space, the way they moved the ball up the pitch. Um, but playing them is, was just a different story. Uh, their forwards, although they're making space and different uh, things like that when, on their attacking approaches, they actually were tough up when we had the ball. They were ferociously tackling in full forward line, half forward line. They were getting a lot of joy out of turnovers um, on our 45 and a lot of scores, a lot of unforced errors and mistakes were costing us the game in the first half. So you know that's coming and you prepare for it and then when it happens you're like, Oof, it's even better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, yeah, re really is. Um, it's, it, it's very hard to look up. I was saying, yes, I was saying to other people during the week there that they were asking sort of similar questions and we, we did a lot of unforced errors, but it probably came from the back of pressure in other areas that led to unforced errors. So it, it mightn't have been uh, a tackle at that moment. I know we kicked two over the sideline um, in that first half, but they probably came from being put in those situations. I know the goal as well came from two turnovers in a row ball came out so uh, yeah they got a lot of joy from the the work rate that their forwards bring to their team so it's the pressure that you feel under irrespective by putting you under pressure straight away you feel under pressure all the time even when you might have a little bit more time yeah it, it's it's uh i suppose it's like the it, in rugby when um the forward goes to make the tackle he probably missed the first tackle but he's put under that much pressure that the second man is the man that actually makes the tackle yeah, and it's um, given certain pictures to, to players to make them feel like they're a little bit haunted or a little bit claustrophobic. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. In terms of uh, the performance against um, Mayo then, when Tip were on the field, Michael, was there stuff that you kind of, again, like that, you knew that they were going to do but couldn't stop them doing anyway? Yeah, kind of like a similar thing, to be honest. Um, we had, we had a hell of a lot of unforced errors in that first half, but it's because we were under such significant pressure from them, certainly around the middle of the field and definitely from their inside forward line who were working the whole way back to, you know, our 65 and a lot of the time their own 65, um, putting in ferocious tackles, ferocious work rate. Um, and you we knew it was coming. We knew that would be probably the step up that they would try to bring. Um, and... We, we talked about it, but it, it just looked, you, you, on the day, we just didn't didn't really deal with it well. Um, and, and it probably cost us, especially in that sec second quarter, I would say. The thing about Mayo that seems to have been so impressive is, as you say, Michael, that full core press that they implement and how good those forwards have been without the ball. You've played them a couple of times at this point. Have they gone to a whole other level in that department this season? Yeah, I suppose we, we, we've that's a third time playing them now in five years. I'd say it's it's certainly probably the the most intensity they brought to a game um, to put pressure on our backs. Like, look, they're on top of the, on top of the work rate that they have. You are, you're also talking about some brilliant forwards. So you're worried for our backs. Like you're worried about you know marking your man being as tight as you can. And when we turn the ball over, then they're then they're putting you under further pressure again. Like it, it, it's a very tough station for for those guys, and you know we just didn't really move the ball um, like we like we wanted to in that first half. Um, but yeah, I, I I did feel that you know certainly they they were ferocious around the middle of the field, and when they did turn it over, they had they had so many runners coming from their half back line, um, from their midfield, and and it caused us a lot of problems going the going the other way. You did, however, manage to put a serious dent into the scoreline and there will have been serious worries I'd imagine on, on the Mayo front in terms of the damage you did to them in the second half especially in that semi-final what was that down to do you think that that upturn in your fortunes up front at least in the second half um, 
it's probably it's probably twofold. Like, look, I'd say it can it can be hard, you know, being being Mayo in that situation because you're pretty much at a hiding to nothing. Like, you know, if you continue to do what you're doing, everyone just kind of says, "Asher, that was the game." So maybe they dropped their intensity by five or ten percent, and and it probably afforded us a little bit more space to do what we do, but we, or do what we did in that half. But we were we were a lot better. Um, we moved the ball a lot better. We tried to be a bit more direct. Tried to properly have a go because you know we we really had nothing to lose from that point on. It was just a pity that we couldn't have done that in the first half and, and seen where it would have taken us in that second half. Do, do you find that on your own kick out? that the Mayo players are pushed so far up that you've got an unbelievable amount of space in front of you and the same with Connor as well. Like, I wasn't at the game and a lot of people have only watched it on television as well. Can you just paint the picture of how much space there actually exists between your forwards and, and your backs when Mayo are doing that full-court press? Yeah, um, I, would, I, I, I wouldn't say that they're overly kamikaze about it. I think they right. back their forwards as well, that if you do, if you do get off, if they do... You know, if we got off a short kick out, that they would be able to put us under pressure, man on man up there. They're not really committing extra men into our back line to to try and really condense the space. It's, I'd say more so because they're just they're confident in in what their forwards can bring and and how much space they can cut off. Um, but obviously, when, look, we got some joy going along because but we we've you know we had some very big lads out around the middle who were able to win their own ball, and it's probably the most the easiest way to get the ball up the field is long catch and then and then move it as quickly as you can into the inside forward line and you know hopefully get them chasing back towards their own goal but it, it I wasn't like it, it certainly wasn't a, a, an Australian team against the Ireland uh, situation from a few years back where you know they nearly committed all 14 or 15 men up into the opposition half it was more controlled I think more measured um, and and it was like look, every time it nearly the first half probably stopped us going short because they were getting such joy after a turnover. Uh, Padraig, can I just go back to, to something you said there a, a moment ago, just to, about the ferocious intensity that Dublin bring? Is that on a whole other level to the intensity that you experienced against Donegal, for example, who would have been considered as proper All Ireland contenders or, or proper heirs to the crown that Dublin might have left behind this season? Yeah, um, I suppose we done the exact same to Donegal. Mm. Um, we got a lot of turnovers in there in the top half, and we put the pressure on um, that Dublin put on to us. I know uh, um, Dublin have a serious class, so did Donegal, but Dublin have, a, have it's like that little step up from intermediate to senior. Uh, Dublin just have, bring it with so much more intensity, and when it's done to you in a venue that has so much more space, like Crow Park, it was it was a, it was real tough. Um, tough situation to be in. Is that a big factor actually then going from, well, of course it's a big factor going from the athletic grounds to Croke Park, but it's clearly a, a massive step again considering the team you're coming up against are so used to the confines of the space that they're playing in. Yeah, look, look at it. it it's, it's a small advantage, but you're not going to say it's a, it's match winning for, for a team. Mm. Like At the end of the day, it's just another pitch, but uh, it, it is a benefit. It's, it's, it's like playing a wee bit at home for them, but uh, Look, I'm not going to hold that against them in that um, they're just playing their normal game, and um, unfortunately, they just they they've more outings on it than we had. Would you do anything differently now, having had that game under your belt? If you if you to play them again this week, if that game was refixed for whatever reason, what would you do differently? In terms of venue, in terms of game. Well, I, you brought up the venue. That's interesting. Would you have tried to get it moved in retrospect? Was that the thing to do, or was that a no, sideshow? No. Nah, no, no. Um, I think what would happen was it, 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 there'd be a couple of weeks of deliberation and then it'd end up that the game was still in Crow Park. So, no, I don't think we would have done anything differently to try and get the game somewhere else. And just in terms of your, your, how you actually play the game on the field then, like, it, do you do something different on Cluxton's kickouts now that you've experienced that and now you've seen yeah. the intensity? Yeah, Cluxton was getting a lot out short. He was kind of back in his cornerbacks who were kind of sitting on either side of the semicircle. Now it's a dangerous enough kick out because you obviously now you can't go back to the keeper. Um, probably would have pushed another man forward and make him go long more. Uh, we had such big men around the middle third in our half forwards, our half backs, and our midfield, um, and we were dominant teams this year at the middle of the field. So if I was doing it again, yeah, I would have made him try and go as long as possible. Probably would have pushed four men into the full forward line um, to stop him getting that little kick out out. Um, 
even though it is a dangerous kick out, he backs his, his corner backs and his whoever pulls into that space so much because his back is to the play and the first thing he's going to meet is a player. Um, but they do, they, they have full trust in themselves that he's going to win it and he's just going to turn him and, and it's a, an attack on. Every time it was Cluxton's kick out, that we think just led to another attack. This was a slow build-up, it was a slow play, but uh, it, they just treated it like a brand new attack every time. It's interesting that you say that because it's almost as if it's an experience that you need to get the hang of to survive against Dublin. And what we have this weekend is a team who, at least uh, over the course of the last decade, seem to have built up a knack of how to at least get within touching distance of Dublin. Do you believe, Podrick, that Mayo have the exact tools and the, the exact experience to be the one team who might push them this year? Uh, look, it may have had the experience of playing them so many times. Um, every, every game hasn't, like, there's been years that people said they were going to whitewash Mayo and it just hasn't happened. Um, Mayo are a team that are really physically strong and really, really put it up to them. Um, now, in different games that Mayo have played, if they give Dublin, like just in our own experience, if they give Dublin any any inkling of uh, just weakness, that, that, that Dublin will take advantage of that. Um, I know in, in the Tipperary game, when Mayo did let Tipperary in, Tip probably could have, Michael yourself, uh, could have been in for two or three goals in the first half. That probably would have changed the game. And I just think Dublin would punish that. Um, and And like when we were playing them, they were five points out of sight. It was always a cushion that we were chasing. Um, they got that good start and it was just really, really tough. We were just chasing the game and then when we did, when they did get on top, they knew we were going to go for goals. So they just kind of, uh, just absolutely pulled everyone into the middle and every high ball that we were getting joy on in, in our previous games, uh, they weren't even competing for it. So their game management was, they, like they just wanted the ball to break and, and bodies there. So their game management now is, is, is very, very good. Um, they cynical foul us as we we tried to build momentum if we got a score to slow the game down so it's just something Mayo is going to really really have to uh it, it they're going to really really have to do their homework on them and and know how to play the game that must be incredibly frustrating where you know exactly what the opposition is doing and you're you're falling victim to it as it happens you can see it and you can't interrupt the pattern yeah yeah and it was funny, someone said to me during the week um, that it was like playing a game of whack-a-moles. You curb the influence of one or two and another two or three pop up and, and start playing. So it, it's very tough to, to manage a game like that. Yeah, the biggest whack-a-mole is obviously Brian Fenton. Michael, talk to us a little bit about you know, where Fenton stands at the moment and his evolution as a footballer because every year we think, I can't get any better. That's it now, he's peaked and actually all of a sudden it's like, well, there's still a little bit to go, it turns out. He can always find another couple of percent. Yeah, he's he's just, he keeps finding, you know, new things that, you know, bring him to the next level. Like, you you see the movement, you know, I know he kicked the point against Cavan, where he'd moved into the full forward line and comes around and kicks one on the loop, and you're just like, that's a midfielder doing that and making it look easy. Like, um, I, you know... He just he's he's so good to watch. You never ever see him make mistakes, but he's always being progressive with the ball. Um, he's never really trying to take an easy option and just you know pop one off. It's always how how can I start this attack? How can I move it into a better place so that someone can get a score? And you know if he continues on the trajectory, there's no no doubt he keep improving, which which is a, more of a scary thought for everyone else. I think. What way would you go in terms of marking him then? And like, is, is there a specific man for Mayo this weekend, Michael, that you'd say he could do a job on him? Um, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's many people in the country can do a job on him, yeah. to be honest. But um, like, I, I suppose, like physically, you're probably going to have to look at putting Matty, Matty Ruan on him. Um, maybe Aidan O'Shea spends some time in midfield as well. Um, but Mayo have a lot of other options that, on the bench as well, so it's not a 70-minute job. You know, Tom Parsons can come in. You know, I think Shane O'Shea might be a bit closer back from injury. There's another body. You know, they have a lot of big men around the middle of the field, so maybe if someone goes in, does a 35, 40-minute job, and then you switch it out and get fresh legs in there to ask a different question as well. So it's 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 not an easy job. It's it's more so the graveyard. It is the graveyard shift, but it could be the winning of the game is, is trying to shut it down and shut him down properly. 
it's funny how um, the debate about splitting Dublin and the money and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's, there's players like Fenton who can't be enjoying that conversation that's happening around them when, when he thinks about his own journey to get from somebody who was not heralded that much. I know there's some talk now, and it might be revisionist, it might not be, it might be the, the true blue doves understand that, you know, there was uh, stuff going on um, in his uh, family life and education and all that kind of stuff when he was 17, 18 that prevented him really from flowering as a, a minor and a, a, a heralded minor. But it's interesting to see somebody like that develop and, and how the doves have managed to bring somebody like that who wasn't announced as a superstar, Michael, before he becomes ultimately the biggest superstar in the game at the moment. Yeah, and it, it probably shines a light on, you know, sometimes in the GA we put a bit too much probably credence in, you know, what a player is like at 17, 18, 19, and we, you know, even at that stage you try to shoehorn them into being one thing or another. Um, and most players don't develop at, you know, at that age. They're probably not at their prime until they're 25, 26, and they've a hell of a lot of learning to do. Like, Larry Corbett was the same in Tipperary. He didn't play in a minor under-21 team. So, like, you know, there's... Like, while those things are very big at that time in your life, they're not to be all and end all. And sometimes we could, we, we probably should be pushing the fact that, you know, playing at that level is great, but it's not the ultimate end goal, I would say. And he's he's going to be the shining example of that when it comes when it comes down the line, whenever he does finish up, I would say. Did he have a specific plan for Fenton Podrick? Um, <clears throat> it was just stop him at midfield. Um, don't, uh, the, the man was on him, or man marker was on him, and it was just a matter of picking him up when he got into that space. But he just bypassed that. He was he didn't catch much ball in midfield, but his attacking threat was phenomenal. He ran through just players with ease, um, lads that would be physically very very strong for us. And just if if he wasn't kicking the ball over the bar himself, he was creating scores. Um, he was he was very very hard to uh, man to stop. He was he was bombing forward. His his athleticism is fantastic. He um he he has so many aspects. As Michael said, he went inside and turned around and kicked the score like a full forward. Um, so if there was some marking him again, he changed his game. He went inside. He just he got himself into the game. If the if a man marker was trying to stop his influence. What what do you do about Conor Callan and what do you do about Kieran Kilkenny? What what's the pre-game plan and what happens in the middle of the game? You're like, okay, we need to reassess here because they've responded to what we're doing. Yeah, it's, it's, they're both very physically big men and, and have a lot of influence on Dub's play. play. Um, what they were doing was they were just getting on ball and setting it up to two lads like Small and uh, I know McDade chipped in a lot against us. It was if if they weren't doing it, they were going to create a chance for someone else to do it. So it, that's just uh, a selflessness in their running. And how does that manifest itself? Does that mean that you just you have to stay tight to them and that creates the space? <laughs> yeah, it's just every, every man has to win his own battle. Um, I know even I was probably the last man in the line and found myself on a couple of different players during the match. Um, when they did break lines and different things and chip the ball over the bar, there was nearly more Dublin players annoyed at them for not trying to go for the goal first. So they were always striving for better in each other. So you can hear that. They're actually giving each other lip a little bit. A wee bit, yeah. Right, yeah. that's interesting. And uh, obviously they don't bear any grudges about it, but um, it reminds them all the next time that there's another pass there. Yeah, yeah, and it is. It's uh, it's that that was at them when probably they were 12, 13 points up. You know, there was just no foot off the pedal. And that kind of plays into your whack a mole analogy, which I'm just interested in going back to project. Like, is that are, are the moles coming from the, the backs running forward, the midfields penetrating? Is it the bench? Like, that, that sort of assault in the senses uh, about 50 minutes in. Like, that doesn't sound we, like much crack, Warwick. No, it doesn't, basically. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, what is, is there a plan beforehand when you know that there are this player and that player who are going to come off the bench and there is going to be a couple of all-stars who are going to be introduced with fresh legs for 20 minutes? Like, how do you psychologically prepare yourself for that, knowing that there might have been an eventuality where you're also approaching that situation being a few points down? You, you just have to prepare yourself for every situation. Mm -hmm. um, I know it, for Mayo... <sighs> They can't give Dublin a head start, as I said earlier. We were just chasing the game when we were five points down at half time. 
Um, I, like it's it's literally going to be attacking every 15 minutes and just I think the longer you stay in the game with Dublin the more uh, doubt is going to creep into their heads um, we we prepared as well as we could now I, I know we didn't play as well as we could on the day and that was a massive factor that was down to our ultimate losing the game but uh, um, I just think I, I, I think Mayo will mix it up better than them as we did um, well, can I just get your take on that then, Michael, uh, in terms of the specifics of this weekend? Like you've mentioned, you've played this Mayo team three times. I think it's a, it's a fact, really. They need to be even better than those two seasons in which you played them in the past for them to get anywhere near Dublin this weekend. Are they better than the last few times you played them? Um, if you went directly off the scoreline, yeah. Like we were mm. closer in, in 16, closer in 18, um, and they blew us away in, in, in one half, really, um, this year. So, look, I'd say they are probably maybe a bit closer. Um, they've reinvented their team. They, you know, have a huge changeover in personnel, um, but have retained the things that make them good, which is, you know, the really strong running through the middle of the field you know, very clinical when they get chances up front um, and very physical in the tackle um, and, and well able to turn the ball over. Um, so, like, look, they, they have a chance. I, I think, like, this Dublin team is, is the best that's ever played the game, though you need to factor that in. And, you know, in any other era, maybe this Bayo team would be well fancied going into an All-Ireland final, but it's it's just what the level of opposition that they're coming up against has been unprecedented in the GA area. Yeah, that, that dominance isn't really great for the evolution of the sport. It's, it's kind of hard for us to have that conversation without then opening up the whole uh, splitting Dublin in that conversation. But, um, you know, we, we saw the Limerick Hurlers reach a level of dominance this year. Great teams bubble up, Michael. And I, I don't know where you stand on all those comparisons that we're seeing at the moment. They do, they do. Like, but you can see, like, you can see a lot of the hallmarks um, actually that shared between Limerick and Dublin, you know, you see the ferocity that Limerick brought to the game around the middle of the field, which is the same as what Dublin do to, to players coming out against them. Um, you can see the selfless run. You can see, you know, their their decision making. Both teams' decision making. Limerick's is probably the best at the moment. They never take silly shots. They're always working the ball to the man in the best position to take the score. Same with Dublin as well. So, like, look, teams do bubble up. I think I think it's slightly overplayed. Um, you know the the Dublin Dominus team. I think there is, I think there is a golden generation of players that have been there since since 2013, 2015 and onwards. Um, and and what comes behind them, who knows what's going to happen then? They might, like there has been basically two teams that have rolled in in together, and and they've been lucky that you know that has happened. The younger guys were able to learn off some All Ireland winners who were there and now have taken it on to a whole new level. But it'll be interesting to see in four or five years' time when when a lot of those guys start to step on what those come through behind. We did want to ask you about Gerald Hegarty as a, as a footballer as well. Looks like he's going to be hurler of the year and deservedly so. What a season he's had! But apparently he's not bad at football. Oh, incredible! Yeah, um, I would have played against him in Division Four in twenty, I'd say thirteen and fourteen or fourteen and fifteen. Um, an incredible footballer, quite similar to what you see on the hurling field, just glides across the ground, but had all the skills, could play, could you know, was brilliant in the air. They moved him between midfield and the full forward line um, seamlessly. Um, and look, I'd say if you probably chatted to him, he probably he'd say that his experience playing senior football maybe, you know, grounded him for going in playing senior hurling as well. And it's no harm that players can move between both codes. It, it's 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 certainly not going to detriment to him considering he's. You know, very probably going to be hurler of the year this year. Um, but yeah, fantastic footballer was was brilliant, and you know we always had massive battles with Limerick. Um, all again this year again. So yeah, he was he was always one we had to watch out for. Uh, it's prediction time, and and uh, it's not easy, but it's a bit easier I think because we have a team are quite heavy favourites here. Probably, are, are Dublin going to win by four or five points, or will there be an upset? I, I I'd love to see an upset, obviously. Um, just the way Dublin's dominance has gone over the years, so uh, I, I, my heart says Mayo, but me, me head says Dublin. And um, in a close game. In, in a close game, I'd, I'd love to see it close up until uh, the, the fourth quarter. I think then that's Mayo's time to mix it. Right. 
Uh, Michael, what, what hope do you hold out for uh, a Mayo victory? Um, again, like, look, I, I think I said it earlier, any other year you'd really fancy them going into it, but it's just the fact of what they're coming up against. And what stands out for me is is the game where, where Dublin put 2-6 on them in a, in a third quarter. Is it last year or the year before? Last year, yeah. And, and it, yeah, it's just that power that power play, um, you know, can they withstand that is, is, is what kind of is really kind of pushing me towards Dublin. I think Mayo will be close. I think they can, I think they have the physicality to go against Dublin. I think it'll really, it'll be a, a, a game featuring a lot of athleticism, a lot of hits. Um, you know, it'll be really good to watch. It's a pity there won't be a crowd there to see it because, you know, there'll be people bouncing off each other. But I just think, I just think Dublin just have the edge. They've had the edge over Mayo for the last while. Um, and it, it's always hard to 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 push, you know, in that situation. So I I probably lean towards Dublin. I think it'll be close, but I think they'll just have they'll get their purple patch, and I think that could just move the the game away from Mayo. Michael, we had you on the show a couple of days after you beat Cork to win your first Munster title since 1935. Podrick, I think this is the first time we've had you on since that unbelievable day for Cavan as well. How great have the last few weeks been, even in the aftermath of the Dublin defeat? Has there been a deep appreciation for that first Ulster title in 23 years? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, the buzz is still there in the county. You have kids in school that still, still they're playing football now. The interest is there. Um, around the county, there's, there's still a buzz in families and different things like that. They're, Calvin flags are still flying. Uh, they've, they've become the new Christmas decorations. So uh, it's it's great to see around towns and around different small areas and different things. Just the the fun and the uh, the buzz it brings to those areas is just fantastic. Good stuff, lads. Enjoy the weekend. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. Thanks very much. Right, good stuff there from uh, Park and from Michael.